Thank you everyone for attending our panel today. Um, usually I find that I get these like 8 a.m. slots and it's really awful. And so I'm very, very happy that it's a late slot. So thanks for everyone who has hung in there with us. So over the last couple years, uh, several of us have been talking about vulnerabilities in depth. And we started down this path of saying, does anyone really care about vulnerabilities anymore? And it turned into this conversation, well, it was, if it's a zero day, well, then it's really important, but otherwise, maybe no one would care. So we want to get some people here today. We've got a pretty large panel of folks, so I'm going to try to keep them reined in as best as possible. Um, and I wanted to get some people that had some you know, good thoughts but were really easy to manage, that weren't that opinionated, that wouldn't go off on rants. <laughs> and if you know anyone up here, um, we'll see what happens, right? So um, yeah, fail already. Thanks for that. <laughs> So anyways, hopefully this will be a good panel for you. I know a lot of times panels can be a real pain, but we're going to try to make this interactive, uh, good, some good topics that maybe aren't uh, discussed as they should be. Uh, so the first thing with a good panel is getting the right people up here, uh, and I think that we have that. Uh, hopefully you know all these people. If you don't, I'm not going to waste any time of the session introducing their bios. Well, we've got Brian from OSVDB, Steve from CVE, Karsten from Secunia, uh, Art from CERT, yeah, wait a minute. Uh, Dan from uh, HP Tipping Point, Katie from, uh, I don't know who's whistling for Katie or Dan, uh, <laughs> um, Katie from Microsoft and Alex, I don't know where you are anymore, so I'll just call you Alex. All right, so we're going to kick it off. Uh, we're going to try to do four questions, about 10 minutes each, and then at the end there's going to be some free-for-all. If you really feel like you need to yell at one of the panelists, there's a microphone, come on up, but otherwise you can hold it to the end, your call. Um, so the first one we're going to start off with is, does anyone that doesn't work on one of these things really care about vulnerability databases, tracking, or trending anymore? And I'd like to start off with maybe Steve or Brian, you guys want to pop in? Uh, people care, but they don't know they care, near as I can tell. Um, at least on the CVE side, we rarely get many, uh, many complaints about, uh, about what's going on with us. Sometimes we have like uh, blatant errors in CVE descriptions that we never hear of from, from anybody. Um, so in a sense, uh, uh, people don't necessarily care. It seems like a really easy job to just like comb through thousands and thousands of vulnerability reports every day that uh, uh, always, most of which have uh, one of the following four uh, properties, which I call the, the four I's. Uh, vulnerability reports are either incomplete, they're inaccurate, they're inconsistent, especially, say, between a vendor report and a researcher report. Not like we ever get those kind of inconsistencies. Uh, incomprehensible. Uh, some, some of the stuff that we're dealing with comes in in a, a broken English from, you know, people who live in the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> poorly formatted advi advisories where the, more, the most serious vulnerability, they don't even quite realize what it is, and it's buried in like a single sentence in a, you know, three-page screed about, you know, what they had for breakfast or something. Uh, that's the kind of raw information that we have to deal with on, every, uh, on a daily basis. And unless you really deal with that kind of stuff on a daily basis, it seems like really easy. Oh, just scrape all these websites or take in all these emails and then just do a little bit of analysis in, uh, you know, in two minutes and then uh, push this thing out. Uh, unfortunately, there's a tendency that all of us in the vulnerability information industry uh, have, uh, which is we kind of care about correctness and quality. And in, in some ways, uh, this is why I think we're having this panel now, uh, because uh, quality comes at a steep price. So you want to talk about CVE? And uh, are we still working on CVE these days? <laughs> Just get right out and ask me. Is CVE dead? No. <laughs> Prove it. Uh, how, however, we are going through, we are going through a, a, a change. So we're kind of in a cocoon, and we'll kind of come out like beautiful butterflies or whatever. Um, but there, there's, there are a couple of realities, OK? First of all, just the raw number of vulnerability reports coming out is, is uh, increasing uh, significantly. The complexity of the vulnerabilities that come out are, are really difficult to sort of capture. Um, yeah, we could go uh, along the lines of other people and just call things memory corruption, uh, which is really code for some kind of buffer overflow that we don't really know how to describe exactly. But at least on the CVE side, 
uh, what we've been doing is, is caring a lot about the kind of the uh, academic strength aesthetics of what are the real root causes lying underneath these vulnerabilities. So, so terms such as memory corruption, uh, we actually try and dig a little bit deeper. What that means, though, is that there's a lot bigger analytical overhead in our pursuit of of correctness and those of you who follow CVE on a regular basis you may see increasing levels of precision increasing levels of correctness but it's come at a pretty high price um, one of which is the the entry to have people on our team uh, gets a little bit a little bit high in terms of the technical skills that are required uh, and then and then the other price as well though is that you know we're at a constant level of funding and the numbers of vulnerabilities are getting uh, reported are uh, you know more vulnerabilities and more complex vulnerabilities something's got to give and in this case recently um, what's been giving is the actual number of CVEs that we've been uh, that we've been publishing but uh, this year especially we're working a lot on modifying our processes uh, to change that ultimately. Brian? Yeah real quick OSVDB has uh, two different ways to handle this the first one we tried was crowdsourcing so we would put memory corruption in the title, and we figure, hey, there's a lot of smart people out there. There's the researcher, whoever else could clear it up, and of course, no one did. So after a while, we went with our backup plan, which is just let Sakunya do it all. <laughs> <laughs> Any comment? I just wanted to comment on whether, you know, does anybody actually care about Vulns? Because it seems like everybody wants to talk about infrastructure, you know, virtualization and cloud and mobile and puke. So uh, at the end of the day, all these various infrastructures are all just delivering applications. Applications have vulnerabilities. It's, it's the same thing getting delivered. It's still a web application. It's still a web browser. And they're full of vulns. And it, the, just because the infrastructure changes doesn't mean the vulnerabilities really change that much. There, there's actually a blind spot that exists right now um, with respect to uh, cloud-based services and services in general, which is that us as vulnerability information sources don't cover those. You know, if there's a if there's a vulnerability in you know the Google uh, you know Google search engine or something like that, you know maybe it can be used to hack millions of people or whatever. But that's a that's an online service. That's not deployable software that goes into the enterprise. So uh, while I think we've been doing a good job in general tracking trends, that that is one area that's a really big blind spot, and it's going to get worse and worse as the adoption of services increases. Yeah, I, I completely agree because if you look at the trends that have really occurred over the last five years or so, so many of the things that have actually moved are web-based, whether it's browser or app. Um, tracking a trend like SQL injection actually becomes quite fascinating because it actually moves as opposed to, you know, some other stuff from Microsoft, for instance. <laughs> with, regard to, with regard to the care, like, at least we hope that people care and that all the efforts that we make aren't in vain. And at least there are some people attending today, so it's not completely zero care. Um, but sometimes we see ourselves as making an analogy like we're providing electricity. None of us are sitting in here now excited about this light, but we would be complaining if there wasn't. Um, and the same when we do the vulnerability databases, when we correlate all the information, when our advisories get out, when they're correct, when everything is, is as it should be, it seems like no one's really paying attention. Uh, it, it's not the type of thing where people say, oh, that's excellent, that's good. Uh, but if we send out an advisory with just like a small typo, we within five minutes actually have a haha -ha mail sent to us. So at least with us, we spend a lot of time making sure we get it correct. Everything from the analysis of the core problem and the vulnerability down to, yeah, spelling. So I think we kind of live in this, I mean, security people kind of live in this world where vulnerabilities, uh, each vulnerability, you know, it's a beautiful snowflake, right? Each vulnerability <laughs> actually, are. yeah, they are, they're each one unique. Um, but, you know, it matters a lot to us as security people and security people working inside of giant mega corporations, it matters to us, each vuln matters. But to the broader world and, you know, maybe to some people who call themselves security people but don't actually care, you know, maybe they're talking... APT in the cloud, whatever, you know, puke, as you said, right? Bingo. Um, you know, maybe those people, they're thinking to themselves, well, phones don't pwn people, exploits pwn people, you know, so they really only care about exploitable phones. They only care about exploits. So, you know, with all of these vulnerability tracking databases, I think for a lot of the population, what they really cull out of those databases is what's exploitable or what has an exploit out there, as in, what do I need to get off my lazy butt and deal with right now? I love that because I think I saw two tweets on the Zero Day and WordPress 
and all of you people keep retweeting that Metasploit 4 is out, so thanks, I know. <laughs> uh, so at CERT, we, we had the same, same feelings as Steve and, and Karsten. Um, we wanted to be correct and count every vulnerability in the world. Within maybe the last year or two, I've come to the realization that, that people do care. They do because they want to count a vulnerability, call it something, scan for it. They want to be in compliance, uh, see if they can patch for it. They need to name it something. Sadly, they don't really care how accurate the advisory is for, to, to a large extent. If you're really going to, you're dealing with something hot and it's zero day and there's special mitigation advice and you've got to do something right, maybe it matters. But I think the big need is just having a label on the thing and being able to talk about that. And it's the same label so that when we're all talking, you don't have to have eight different IDs. You've got one ID that you know, rules them all, which is probably should be CVE. The places where accuracy has come into play, at least what I've seen at CVE, are, you know, all this root cause analysis I think is kind of cool and, and, and I've had kind of a mindset of, well, this may help influence how people think about vulnerabilities as these darling precious snowflakes that mm -hmm. each and every one of them is. Um, but but when, we do, when we do get complaints on the CVE side of things, uh, in general it's, it's two things. Uh, either the affected versions of the software we might be a little imprecise about, uh, and then characterizations of the severity of the issue, ultimately the CVSS score. And that kind of make, makes sense, right? Because that's ultimately what people seem to care about. It's how, how, what is going to be the impact to my enterprise? I don't care if this is some you know, brand new, really, really cool attack that deserves a pony. Is it going to hurt me or not? Th this thing is, is a 9.8. I have to do something. Yeah. There's a lot of that mindset in the enterprise user sort of community. So. Can, can anyone up here, does anyone know how many public vulnerabilities were disclosed in any given year? I think OSVDB might be the closest these days. Well, if you're talking about just the overall numbers, one of the reasons that we say that we have an accurate number is because we're the only ones that abstract to the level we do, where every single specific vulnerability in every script gets its own ID. And everyone else across the board, CBE, Sakunya, everyone, says, no, we're going to lump them together. And yeah, that kind of moves into some of the stats. Them's stuff. fighting words. That's yeah, no, yeah. But, <laughs> there are lots of different ways of there are lots of different ways of counting vulnerabilities. Oh, I'm not going to dispute that you guys have a lot better coverage than and, <laughs> than any of the other sources up here because you guys really try and track everything and you yeah. you know you guys put in really long hours into it. Also, your analytical overhead in general is very minimal. You, your work goes into let's compose a title and uh, you have fairly simple ways of like breaking things down. Uh, that get a little bit more complex, at least for at least for CVE. When we're dealing with, for example, shared code bases, and we're looking at two different bugs, we may intentionally combine them. Uh, in other cases, we kind of have to look a little bit deeper to figure out if we need to split them or not. Because right. uh, in some cases, uh, you know, if we have two CVEs that are out there that are duplicates. That's kind of okay, but if we have like uh, one, I hate duplicates by the way, don't get me wrong, but if we have one CVE out there that kind of combines multiple issues inadvertently, then the utility of the CVE uh, goes down if people, vendors are only fixing like one part of it and not, and not the other part. So um, that said, the way that you guys have structured things I think is really good because you, well, you can be the closest to counting the total number of vulnerabilities that are disclosed using the way that you count things. Well, on that note, let's, let's move to the next one. Like, hey, which talks about the trends and the yeah. metrics. This is just a natural flow and plus, you know. <laughs> to answer so what are the vulnerability was, trends? It was average 8,000 a year. Yeah, I, I, my, my point being, who cares if you can't even, if you can't even put a, a, a measurement on the number or how bad are vulnerabilities? I mean, we're just making stuff up, which... Uh, know, I'm going to cover are. that. Okay. All right. Is that the next question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what are some trends and vulnerabilities, disclosures, types, volume uh, that we're seeing? And then are these security metrics even worth a damn? So, <laughs> so what if you count this many? What does that really mean? So, uh, so the first question is, who out there thinks that vulnerability statistics are helpful and useful and you actually do currently use them in any capacity. Anyone? That's a lot of people I'm sorry. That are wrong. I mean, you are absolutely Does wrong. this slide help you? <laughs> I can't see this slide. Yeah, what's, we can't see this slide. <laughs> oh yeah, my panel doesn't know the slide. It's the, uh, the vulnerability counts from OSVDB. Okay, so uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up about vulnerability stats, just as a, a quick idea, 
um, there were 8,337 vulnerabilities in 2010. Does that sound like a useful statistic? Only compared year yes. over year. It's, it's over time that I think it does become useful. Okay, well, I mean, like the media will call up and ask us, you know, how many yeah. vulns were there last year? As so, if they knew what was the previous year. Right, well, right. Th they will get to that, and I will too. So, uh, you know, I have to footnote, well, that's according to OSVDB. What about other VDBs? Well, there were 3,648 according to Secunia. Well, wait, why the discrepancy? Well, now you have to get into different kinds of databases. Secunia's database is geared for a very specific use. They have an entire customer base that actually uses their database for day-to-day -day patching, notification. You know, it's an entirely different system than OSVDB where we're looking for long-term stats, history, and we abstract the way we do. Yeah, like our customers, they would like flog me publicly if we started doing what OSVDB do and send out one advisory for every single issue. Uh, what they care about and how people, like the idea of how to use our database is how many like actions do I have to take so if there are 10 vulnerabilities being fixed by one patch, then they just want one advisory listing the 10 vulnerabilities and the patch. They want to know which product is affected, um, how many vulnerabilities, how critical are they, how do I fix it? And then there's that subset of people that actually care about the core details of each vulnerability. But they just want to know how do we fix it. So we, they don't want to have 10 advisories that tell them to install the same patch. Right, and that's why it goes back to that, is that OSVDB would be horrible. It would be useless in that situation because it would saturate them. So after that, the next question is that figure more or less than 2009. And so I say there's 7,678 vulnerabilities in 2009, less than 2010's total, according to OSVDB. Next question we obviously get is, is 2011 on par with the last? Well, there's 3,427 as of July 25th. This does not appear to be on par. So now all of a sudden we have one number that we start out with that as soon as you start putting context around it and you start even looking one year either direction, the, the stat starts to lose some of its meaning. On There's also an assumption in those stats that your analytical capabilities are keeping on par with the publication sources that you're monitoring. So for example, right. a couple of years ago, I think you guys started scraping almost the bottom of the barrel looking on uh, <laughs> various, various sites that no one else was looking at. And right. that affected your numbers for that year and then the, the year future. For us on oh, CVE, exactly. people do a lot of CVE-based analysis counting the number of vulnerabilities without recognizing that uh, you know, we don't have the complete coverage that we used to have due to some oh, of the right. factors that I talked about earlier. Not, not to be a pedantic ass, but the stats don't lose the meaning. Stats are just numbers. What loses meaning, what, your problem with meaning is actual the model. You're inferring meaning in, in what you're doing there. Okay, so it's not, it's not the numbers, it's your quest for knowledge out of the numbers. Right, well it's interpretation of that and that's why I say it's all about context. <clears throat> You well, know? right, right, and, exactly. And I think that's what Dan, I was just going to say, Dan Guido's been pointing out lately, of course, which vulnerabilities do you actually need to worry about. Mm -hmm. I think where the context and the numbers actually mean something is when you then pair them with attack data. And then you can see, are the trends similar, completely different? You know, yeah, ActiveX disclosure is going nuts, and everybody's getting owned with ActiveX. Same thing with SQL injection, but not the same thing with pick whatever vulnerability type, you know. So that's, that's where I think it actually, you get more of a whole picture. Because people actually want to know, how am I getting owned? I don't care if there's a vulnerability out there that attackers don't use. Yeah, in, in a sense, in a sense, it's, it's, it's too bad that the media can't ask you smart questions. But well, that they, doesn't make the numbers any less useless. Well, the funny part is, is that they ask these questions. They're like, well, you know, is there anything else you want to contribute to this? And, you know, next morning they wake up and they have a 17-page mail from me explaining all this. And they're like, okay, thanks for your time. You know, yeah. the hell if they're going to write about it. You've got to write smaller messages. So this is the case is of looking for the... <laughs> it, it's the case of looking for the keys under the street light instead of where you think you kind of dropped them. Right. right. This is the only data that's out there. So people, people are looking for it. So real quick to jump back to my example, you know, if 2011 isn't on par with 2010, the question is why? And, you know, so all of us, we know some of the reasons. There's trends, look at phases like cross-site scripting, SQLI. There's certain years where people jumped on the bandwagon. There was the DLL injection on Windows platform where everyone was finding software that did that, you know. 
uh, low hanging. A couple years ago with all the image ones. Image ones, yeah. And the zip ones. So that's low hanging fruit that'll swing the totals. Um, There's change in desires to disclose. You know, a while back everyone's like, well, shit, if I release an advisory, that becomes free advertising for my company. And eventually these companies realize, wait, we're not getting business. And then researchers are like, oh, ZDI, they'll give me all kinds of cash and hookers and blow for this, you know? (laughs) So all of a sudden they have a, a, a very different desire to disclose in the way they do it. Um, there's the ones we know about, the time we have to dig into it, like Steve said. There was a few years where I was a consultant and, you know, I, I didn't work a whole lot, enough to live, and I spent all my other time on OSVDB. And those years, our numbers jumped dramatically because I was scraping change logs. I would go through, like, the Apache bug tracker, and if you've ever been in that thing with all of their projects, it's crazy. And yeah, I was the dumbass that actually went and said, okay, I'm going to search for the word security and start reading every goddamn ticket Apache's ever written with the word security in it pull out every denial of service, every stupid little vuln, every race condition, local permission error, you name it, and we put it in our database. You still have to make a guess, right? Because half the time it's like six words. You know, right. Some of them Fixed were... permission problem. What does that mean? Does that imply security issues or usability issues? Yeah, so not only did we have to write the entry, then it was a techno disclaimer. It says, due to the vague wording of this, we're not sure if it's a security issue. You know, you add this up, and yeah, all of a sudden the numbers jump. So then we get to what I call the security metrics factor. Who in here reads the security metrics mail list? Anyone? (laughs) Allison. Yeah, Uh, okay, stay the hell off of it. (laughs) That is the biggest waste of time of academic masturbation you will ever see. (laughs) As soon as you get close to a real statistic, these asshats like Fred Cohen jump in. What's a vulnerability? (laughs) <laughs> uh, wait, what do you mean? We have to define vulnerability now? So he does. He'll go down this path that, well, you don't know what a vulnerability is. And I say, well, I, I've got an idea what one is. And then he says, well, there's an infinite amount of vulnerabilities. These stats don't mean anything. I said, well, it's not infinite. And I gave him an example. I was like, I have a 10-line program. There is a finite amount of vulnerabilities in this. He says, no, there's an infinite amount. I was like, 10 lines. It's not infinite, dude. Trust me on that. You know, and so he will sit there and argue, and this is just one example. You know, and one way or another, they will figure out a way to make all the stats useless. And you're wondering kind of, what's the purpose of this list again? You know, is it to get metrics, or is it just to kind of like, you know, have a civilized flame war? So long story short, you know, we take all these factors in, and we come to the conclusion of what I think Jack Daniel said, that that original stat I gave you is about as meaningful as my cat weighs 134 miles per hour. (laughs) You know, without context, these stats mean nothing. Metrics aren't very helpful. I mean, how many of you, like you said, how many of you really care that there was 8,000 and some vulnerabilities last year? You don't. Come on, Alex, this is a perfect time for you. How many of you run all that software? No one. There's also the rot factor. Again, I don't understand, Brian, why you're getting spun up, because the numbers are just the numbers. What you're really bitching about is the fact that you don't have a model, right? So propose a model. And then I'll show you five assets that'll tear it down for stupid reasons, and a bunch of panelists that'll tear it down for good reasons. (laughs) And that's, that's what we call scientific method. I call it academic <laughs> masturbation. <laughs> Sir, so what, one of the problems is also that people need to be aware of what they can interpret out of a given number. Mm-hmm. Um, like, we have a lot of those cases like, oh, there's 10 vulnerabilities in product A, 20 vulnerabilities in product B. Which one is the safest product? Yeah. And then they even take the stats perhaps even from, from our side. And that's one of the problems we have in VDB. So also people take those metrics and then they just start interpreting shit out of it. Like, oh, they might even add because it's on the Sukunia side. Sukunia says, this is more vulnerable than this. Like, <laughs> no, we don't. We just tell you there's 10 vulnerabilities in that product. There's 20 in that product. If you want to start evaluating more, what if I add, for instance, that in the product with 10 vulnerabilities, they're all unpatched. The, the product with 20 vulnerabilities, they've all patched within a week. So if we t- factor in time to patch, which one is then the most safe, the safest product? Some of you may have changed your mind now about which one it is. If I then go and add the one that has 10 vulnerabilities, they were all classic stack-based buffer overflows. The one that had 20 issues, they were more complex use after freeze. Which one is now the safest product? Which one would you prefer to use? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point, especially from you know, a big vendor perspective in terms of of if we've actually put in the due diligence to, you know, when we get a vulnerability report, we've actually put in the due diligence to look for variants of that, and we fix all of those too. 
um, you know, for it to be bucketed as something like, oh, well, you know, they just, they just fixed, they had more, you know, they had more vulns. But that, that's not differentiating between vendors who actually do due diligence and find, you know, additional variants or additional vectors, you know, whatever, um, with those who uh, just kind of do the lazy thing and patch one vector incompletely, you know, whatever, and then it, it shows up in these, in these counts as, you know, lazy vendor only had this one, you know, diligent yeah. vendor had a bunch more. So it's, there's no real way to, to differentiate, you know, the lazy from the diligent in this model. Real quick, in case anyone's curious, we're talking about Adobe. I, I was going to say, we, we see it all the time through ZDI. Um, the researchers are actually quite good about testing the vulnerabilities. Um, and I can't tell you how many times they come back and, oh, yeah, it, it still works. They didn't, they didn't patch it. Um, you know, and, and, or there's another vector, whatever the case might be. It happens all the time. Oh, I, wanna, know, I, I do want to hear Katie about silent patching. That's <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. I have one more good <laughs> mouthful of beer. <laughs> I want to claim that a me metrics are totally fine if you understand it and it's your context and you wrote the metric. Um, CERT has this awesome metric that if anyone knows we still publish vulnerabilities once in a while. It goes from zero to 180, two decimal points of precision. So you can tell which ball is more important because there's a number and you can, you can sort them. Um, which is totally worthless to everybody in the world except the people at CERT and actually it only was worth, worthwhile to us years ago when we used it to decide whether or not to publish document A or document B. It was very worthwhile for that purpose at that time and that's it. So he, no, my, no, it is context. But right, my point is, is that you have that one line vulnerability and then you have an 87 line disclaimer you know, rider saying this is what it really means. It, it, it's subjective. I mean, all this, yeah. a lot of this stuff is. So it, that's kind of the, the trick. If, if I might care about some vol, you know, you don't care about it all. I might care about Secunia's vols or Microsoft's. I might not care about all the PHP includes you guys have. M maybe I do. Maybe I'm a PHP web app developer and I'm. You're you know, sick. Well, yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my point, though. That's how people are getting owned PHP. Yeah. Oh. yeah then their metrics are bad because they're not telling them that PHP matters at the moment. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, everybody always asks about Oracle vulnerabilities. Unless you're Litchfield, nobody ever cared. All right, unless you're a pen tester pointing out how broken every deployment of Oracle ever is, nobody cares. Um, but people get owned with cross-site and SQ, you know, everybody's PHP blog was getting owned left and right for it five years ago. And so, still are, still are right, exactly. And so that's my point. I like the way OSVDB does it. Because they actually know what is the attack surface available to attackers. And I think that's important. That's right. entirely dependent on who the researchers are who are concentrating yes. on things and what they're concentrating on. Uh, we, uh, if uh, those of us who've been in this industry for since about 2005 or something like that, remember a Latvian teenager, age 14 or 15, who um, basically decided to spend 10 minutes testing all the software that he could download and came up with 800 vulnerabilities within the course of like six weeks or something like that. And um, just a couple years ago, uh, some guy for Debian uh, basically used um, a super powerful vulnerability detection tool called GREP. I'm not sure what the acronym <laughs> stands for. And he found like 500 vulnerabilities or something like that, right? And so we're still very much subject to pretty much the whims and the fads that researchers happen to go through. And even Foundation. one individual researcher can have a big impact on what these numbers are. That's what were your four true. I's again? Hmm? The four I's? Incomplete, inaccurate, inconsistent, and uh, incomprehensible. And you need a fifth, ignorant. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on. Um, what are your thoughts of the value of vulnerabilities? Bug bounty programs, vulnerability buying and selling, impact on disclosure, and we're going to give it over to Katie, and you can give your little spiel, and we'll see what Dan has to say. Then I have a question for Katie. Oh, good. <laughs> Go back to silent patching. <laughs> uh, I believe the moderator has asked me a question. <laughs> so, uh, so the question um, about bug bounties and, and that type of thing. So um, I don't know, how many of you guys... Uh, saw or heard about, you know, the, the talk that I gave a couple days ago at Black Hat. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just, I'll fill you in as I go. So, um, so I think that uh, a lot of security researchers, um, you know, have varying motivations for what they do. You know, it's not all money. Um, how many of, of you out there, you know, who do this for a living? I mean, 
professionally, um, <laughs> have uh, figured out ways to mint money on the back end of some financial system? Raise your hand. Liars, come on, there's more of you. Anyway, if you, want, if you wanted it, you know, if money was it, right? There's a lot of unsavory ways that people with the dark arts know how to, know how to get money. Um, now, what, you know, what folks like you know, Tipping Point do is, is what we would consider the white market you know, of, of vulnerability buying, and it doesn't really, uh, the numbers don't really um, uh, end up equaling anything close to what the gray and the black market will pay for, right? Um, so there's a lot of researchers out there who, you know, think that it's, uh, you know, it's important to get recognition for, you know, either publicly or among their peers. Um, so when we looked at the uh, possibility of doing some sort of a bounty program, a nominal fee for, you know, for vulnerabilities, we looked at the motivations that were out there, um, and we looked at the motivations for the researchers who are actually finding vulns in our products. Because not every vendor has the same, you know, kind of profile of the researcher that looks at their code. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're a pretty popular, uh, popular um, target, target for research, right? <laughs> Partner, right? We are, yeah. No, we're, but we're, we're a pretty popular target for research. Um, other vendors might have uh, different, you know, different behaviors and different main motivators for, you know, the researchers who look at their products. So we looked at what, what researchers do with our, uh, you know, why they do what they do with ours. And what we found was uh, this past year, we've had about 80% of our vulnerabilities um, you know, that were disclosed at all um, were actually privately reported to us. So 80% were privately reported, you know, let, gave us time to fix the issues, um, and the other 20% were dropped to zero day. Now, in that 80%, considering there are programs like, you know, Dan's over at uh, ZDI that would offer, you know, a comparable price to a bug bounty, like should, should we had decided to do so. Um, in that 80%, 90% of those reports actually came directly to us. So even though they could have made a small amount of money, um, you know, they actually, the majority of the researchers who find loans in our products and want to give them to us to get fixed, actually prefer to come directly to us. So that's what we found when we took a look at that data. Um, now, we absolutely, you know, are fine with the, the researchers' abilities to make money doing their vulnerability research. And I think there's some great programs like ZDI that are out there that, you know, we love. We actually talk about quality of reports. Actually, the quality of reports that come from these guys is, is, is really, really good. So Thank you, Kate. Yeah, no, no problem. But, you know, thank you. <laughs> So that's but, actually, but sorry. hold on. I was going to agree. No, with no, that. yeah. Ag agree with me later. Hold on. <laughs> so, but um, so that's what that's what we found when we looked at our data, when we looked at our researchers, right? So instead of doing a bug bounty, because it seemed like you know there's lots of ways for researchers to make that money. Uh, we decided to do something different, and that's what I talked about a couple days ago. Um, so if you go to www.bluehatprize.com and take a look, we decided to offer uh, over $250,000 in cash and prizes for uh, mitigation research. So we're looking for the next generation platform mitigations. Top prize gets $200,000. So we're going to announce that the winners next year at Black Hat. And the contest has already kicked off. We've actually already gotten some uh, entries to the contest. And there are, uh, you know, so top prize gets $200,000, second prize $50,000. Third prize gets, you know, MSDN subscription worth 10000 um, you know, and money, fame, I guess women, I suppose, if you would, you know, if money and fame bring women, you know. Um, but that's what we decided was, you know, sort of the best way for us to encourage the research community to do what it does, but figure out, you know, ways to mitigate exploitation. Because, like I said, you know, vulns don't pwn people, exploits do. Um, and we wanted, we wanted to encourage uh, the research community to work with us like that. Actually, okay. I, I want to disagree because I think Microsoft is also setting a great precedent that they are rewarding not only badass exploits, but the ones that are completely weaponized. So your bug bounty does exist, and it exists in the sense that I write an exploit, it becomes really good, it owns 200,000 machines and becomes part of a botnet, now you guys offer a reward for information on the botnet. So my motivation is now not just to write a Microsoft exploit, that's, but to write a badass one. That's actually a different thing. You're thinking about the 
the other reward that we have. It has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're, in essence, you were still offering money on what is fundamentally a very good working exploit against Windows systems. Nope. That's not it. <laughs> so um, I think you're thinking about the, the Rustock but, uh, botnet bounty. Um, that's a completely different thing. So that's a quarter million dollar bounty for info that leads to the incarceration of the people who wrote, who, uh, wrote Rustock. Totally different. So what I'm talking What's about Rustock is, this is a, I just announced this like two days ago. I'm sorry you weren't looking, but anyway, listen. <laughs> <laughs> so this is completely different. So. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're taking this approach where, uh, look, there are open problems, you know, in modern exploitation that breaks our platform mitigations, things that break ASLR and DEP, right? So return-oriented programming, JIT spray, that kind of thing. There are open problems there that we're working on mitigating. So what we're actually rewarding are, you know, take one of those open problems, right? And these are for memory corruption vulnerabilities, yes. I know, I said it, and you don't like it, but anyway. Um, take one of those open problems um, in the exploitation of memory corruption vulnerabilities and, uh, and come up with a, with a novel mitigation. So basically, next generation ASLR, next generation DEP, that kind of thing, you know, uh, SEHOP, that type of, of research is what we're looking at. And just, just what? So, He's asking, so the will question, research be the question made is, will the research be made public so that it can be used in other platforms? The answer is, it is up to the inventor. The inventor retains IP ownership of that research. We just get a license to use it, so the inventor gets to choose what the heck they want to do with their research. They want to port it to Linux? Go for it, my friend. Enjoy. You know what I mean? So, yes, um, if the researcher who wins, chooses to make it public, they can do so. They own the IP 100%. From a vulnerability days point of view, um, we can see though that to an extent, bug bounties do matter and they, they do motivate people. Um, I made a nice slide and, and he killed it. So now, <laughs> now I'm just gonna like describe it like this. Um, <laughs> I made a case, for instance, with the CA Bright store. Uh, had a fantastic track record, 2004, 5, 6 onwards. Um, there were like 80 vulnerabilities being reported in one of their Bright store solutions, um, laptops and desktops, I think it's called, in, in 2007. And it actually triggered us. Uh, and there was a time where ZDI was, was paying for uh, CA Bright store issues, and a lot of them actually came uh, via C, uh, CDI. Um, and in the beginning of 2008, as part of our uh, yearly report, we actually went, uh, went out and said CA Bright Store is a solution we consider to be inherently insecure. Not only because of the vulnerabilities, because we already talked about we can't look at that alone, but we also found a lot of those vulnerabilities, my research team, and we could just see the code was terrible. So we went out and said we consider this product inherently insecure. Um, a while later, CDI came up, backed it up, and also stated that they would no longer pay for vulnerabilities in, uh, in Brightstore. After that, how many vulnerabilities have been reported? Hmm. So either they magically suddenly just upped the quality of their product, or people just stopped giving it them and found other places. And, and I think like, Adobe Shockwave is an interesting one, because that has certainly received a lot of attention lately also. And if I understand correctly, you don't pay for Shockwave anymore either. Well, we had a presentation at Cansec West where we showed everybody how broken it was and so yeah, after that, yeah. yeah. So, and I was also finding a lot of those shockwave issues um, and they have some problems in some of their components. Um, so, and it's, it's quite realistic to also expect that since CDI uh, won't pay for shockwave vulnerabilities anymore that, that we will likely see a drop in it because then people will find another target where, where they can get money. So to a certain extent, it, it definitely does motivate people to in choosing which target they, they want to go for. And this is one of the kind of metrics that's much more informative about the relative security of a software package than counting the raw number of vulnerabilities that have been disclosed. I, I can make this quite short. Um, I even questioned ZDI when it came out. Uh, if you go back to 2005, this, this room probably would, little, would have looked a lot different. The whole industry was different. Uh, the number of reverse engineers and researchers on the planet was far fewer. But it was a very naive position to think that that number was not going to grow, that a black market was not going to spring up, 
Um, and if any of you have ever read Freakonomics, it, it pretty much proves that people, uh, there's very good positive response when then there is, is monetary reward. Um, and I think now ZDI is quite proven year over year. Um, it's more and more popular. It's, you know, we, I think we do a good job, uh, you know, being responsible and, and being, you know, popular with both vendors and researchers. Um, but it's, uh, you know, if you look at everybody that's got their own Voln programs now, I think it's been, I think it's been proven that it's a, a model that works. Well, and for us, you know, the, the model that we chose um, for the Blue Hat Prize um, was something where we were looking at, as a, as a platform provider, we were looking at ways to, um, to scale such that we were essentially blocking entire classes of vulnerabilities with some of the research that we hope to get out of this. And, uh, you know, certainly, you know, um, what Simple was, was hinting at is, uh, you know, were we going to share it with the community? And quite frankly, we got ASLR in depth from the community. Why, why shouldn't we give back, you know? So absolutely, um, I think the model that, you know, that we've chosen, and I think there's room for lots of models here. You know, every vendor is not the same. Not every vendor is a platform provider. You know what I mean? So for, for other vendors, other models might make sense. But for us, you know, it makes sense to try and make these changes that, won't, that not only will impact our platform and our applications that run on it, but these are platform level mitigations that will also help third party applications on our platforms and mitigate some of those issues. So for us, we're looking at this, you know, in terms of sweeping, uh, you know, or making much more difficult to exploit entire classes of vulnerabilities. And All I think right, this so is a reflection of a, of a growing trend in the area to move a bit more towards uh, not only defense, like you're talking about with the Blue Hat Prize, but also prevention in the first place, right? There are entire classes of vulnerabilities. We know about these. In the common weakness enumeration, we, we document them, but we still have like 800 different CWE IDs, maybe 20 different ones for stuff that are related to buffer and memory corruption errors. I, I right. said it myself, sorry. I want to get on to um, the next question. But, Come on. This is a good one. I want you guys to talk about being the people that track and deal with researchers as well as vendors. Name names. Tell us who they are. How do you really feel about working with certain researchers and vendors? And I know you guys are going to be, you're not going to be shy about this, so. Who wants to talk about the research quality and vendor response? <laughs> Okay, Ryan, so, should you go first or last on this? <laughs> yeah, so I, I've had a few problems with researchers, and I, I think I'm the only one out of any of us up here that will actually reply to bug track and full disclosure and call them out on it. And uh, part of that is, you know, yeah, quit being a dick and sending this really worthless information, and also just kind of teach a lesson that if anyone's reading these lists, it, strive for a little better accuracy in your reports, because it's not just reflecting on you, but it's causing a whole lot of headache on the part of everyone else involved. You know, if Microsoft gets a report, and I know that they've gotten probably hundreds, if not thousands of these, where there's enough information and they're like, wow, this sounds like it may actually be a, an issue, but the technical information isn't there. And then all of a sudden they're in this like email back and forth and they spend two weeks all to figure out that, well, oh, wait, you have to have local admin privileges to do this, you know? So, you know, one of my, uh, to name names, you know, one of the, the most recent ones for me was HT Bridge, and I'm sure that one or two of you are in the audience. Hi, I'll respond to your mail from three weeks ago when I get home. Um, you know, they started releasing advisories, and uh, it, it's obvious they're using them as a way to promote their company. And there's all kinds of really crappy stuff that they're releasing because they're going after beta products, they're going after real low-hanging fruit. You know, they'll Lame. find... Yeah, well, no, not only that, but they'll find like, oh, here's two cross-site scripting in two different advisories. Oh, and we forgot, or not forgot, we just kind of missed the remote code execution, mm -hmm. you know, and the serious bugs in it. And I don't know how many cross-site scripting issues I've seen reported that are error messages that clearly indicate RFI or... Or, or SQL injection, injection. Yeah. yeah. And they're missing these left and right, and you're looking at it like... Like, you know, if you guys would actually spend some time on this, you would find some really neat stuff, and you're not. And then they also have this habit of, you know, um, as an example, it's like, well, we're going to contact the vendor, and we're going to give them two weeks. And the fact that we typoed on the email and the vendor never got it, it doesn't much matter. You know, we're going to go ahead and release in two weeks anyway. Bottom line is if you're discovering cross-site vulns, nobody thinks you're cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, cross-site scripting is really old. It's really kind of lame, and it's one of those that... Ask John Oberheide. 
Yeah, well, if you're gonna do cross-site scripting, just wait every 30 days and do one post with like all 750 yeah. of them. Okay, so if you, can, if you can own a mobile phone at Pona Own, then your cross-site is worth a crap. Okay. Otherwise, <laughs> disclose it to the vendor or the website or wherever the hell, ask for some swag and be done with it. Right, and, and I'm fine with posting it to the list, it's just don't think that it's anything other than, you know, a novelty for most of these. Um, and, and the other big pet peeve is like uh, SQL injection. It's like, well, here's cross-site scripting, and they will actually include the script code to exploit it. And you're like, okay, well, this is valid. And then when it comes to SQL injection, they're like, and the proof of concept is bracket SQLI bracket. Uh, wait a minute, that's not proof of concept. That's saying, here's the script and here's the variable. And wait a minute, why couldn't they actually put SQLI exploit code in there? Is it because they're morons, or do they actually think, oh, well, if we do that, bad things will happen to the 87 installs of this software that you've never heard of? You know, either way, it's a cop-out, and yeah, it gets really tiresome, and, and I want to be clear that HT Bridge has kind of been my whipping boy for the past year, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, if I actually spent time to respond to all of these lame advisories, it would be more than a full-time job. I gave up responding years ago just because of the amount of time that it took to do that. Right. So, so we, we spend time responding, but it's to our researchers. We don't do it publicly. We do that, you know, we accept about 30% of what is, what is submitted to ZDI. Um, a lot of that is vulnerabilities that we're not necessarily interested in. A lot of that is crappy submissions. And we want to work with the community, and we've, you know, seen researchers come up through the years to make those submissions better. That's obviously in our best interest. But to call someone out, I will, I will call someone out, and then I will also give them kudos. <clears throat> if any of you uh, were aware of the uh, policy change, the only policy change we've ever had was ZDI, we now enforce a six-month uh, deadline. Uh, because there were some vendors that were kind of sitting on their hands and, and HP. not... HP. And, and, <laughs> And that's absolutely Sorry. correct. Yeah, and, and so, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's actually been phenomenal for, for HP because uh, everyone decided, you know what, we're one of the culprits and we want to do this better. Uh, one of the old co other culprits was real networks. If you go back to last year and you see how many real network vulnerability advisories we disclosed, um, there were a lot. And they took that policy change very seriously and look at how much better their software is. Um, so, yes, they were bad, but now they're good. So we, that's, that's positive. We generally experience that. Like in the past 10 years, I've been involved with VDB. I actually overall think that researchers are getting better. They are getting better at providing the details we need. Don't get me wrong. We're still killing about 25% of what is posted on the lists. Um, but the level of quality seems to be, um, be improving. Um, now, Katie has been baiting Steve and I for a while, so let's go back to the memory corruption issue. <laughs> that is one trend that so is going the wrong way. More and more people are using the term memory corruption. <laughs> Seriously, if you're a researcher, then it's because you're damn lazy, or you just don't really know what it is. Uh, there are a couple of valid cases where it's perfectly fine to case, call it memory corruption, but it's been like a thing covering everything from a stack-based buffer flow to a use after free. And hell, we've even sometimes seen it. It's actually just a missing exception handling that just results in an application terminating. So it seems like being the standard thing. Oh, I ran a fossa. Uh, something crashed. Um, I don't really know what it is. Memory corruption. Done. <laughs> sent. That, that's uh, the kind of stuff and, that and we offer. And when you see the same from, from vendors also. Um, and it's like... Come on. I mean, the yeah. vendor should hopefully know what the core problem is. Please tell us, is it a stack-based buffer flow? Is it an integer flow? Is it a use after free? What is it? Like, don't tell us it's a memory corruption. So I, I'll also chime in because, you know, I mean, obviously I, I'm here representing uh, Microsoft, a vendor, but uh, Microsoft also, you know, we actually do vulnerability research on third-party products. I, I founded Microsoft Vulnerability Research in 2008 to do this, so we, and we started releasing advisories on third-party products um, for vulnerabilities we found and work with the vendors to get fixed. So we see it from both sides, too. You know, we are both the researcher and the vendor, and sometimes the coordinator will also, MSBR will step in and coordinate multi-vendor, super nasty apocalypse kind of issues, right? Um, and we'll try, we'll try and uh, do our best to coordinate there. Um, so we feel the pain from all three roles in disclosure uh, a lot of the time. And yes, some of, you know, some of uh, the, the researchers that we deal with are much, you know, much more um, able to articulate their uh, issue than others. You know, but actually, we have seen that you know, same trend where they do actually get better over time. Um, and, uh, Art, and then, do you see and that then, on the cert side? Our, we, we stopped paying careful attention. We stopped counting vulnerabilities. We get maybe 30 
direct reports um, about 30 a month, so maybe one a day, and we don't, we don't run with all of them, um, but probably half or more of those we go with. The, the, the only thing that really up, you know, really bugs us is that we get the, the, the researcher who is looking for some extra fame, and their company's not famous enough yet, but maybe if CERT has an advisory, that'll help. So they're, they'll, they'll be on us to make sure we publish something that has their name in there. It hasn't happened a lot in the past couple years, but that used to really annoy me. But so, do you think that the quality but, of the incoming reports to you has improved? Uh, no, it's, it, it, it's all over the place. There no, are great ones, and there are horrible ones. And I, I, we don't, I can't measure enough to really say there's a trend either direction, but my you know, gut feeling is it's about the same. We, no, and we, we, actually see, uh, we actually see something really interesting, too, in that uh, a lot of researchers are, um, they only come to us with one vulnerability um, ever. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they got lucky, maybe, or they didn't like, uh, you know, doing vulnerability research anymore. I mean, you don't actually, um, we don't really know what it is that, you know, made them come to us just one time and then disappear. I think, I think a lot of times it's pen testing. Yeah, same or, thing. Mean, or accidental discovery. I mean, right. you see something yeah. crash, you bother checking it. Yeah. I, I think a lot of researchers don't look for variants either. I mean, the, right. that was a major pain when PHP application vulnerabilities first started happening. Mm -hmm. You'd have one researcher, one researcher go, oh, I you know, looked at this uh, PHP golf application with 10 downloads in its entire history, and I found this cross-site scripting in these 10 different vectors, and then uh, 10 different parameters or something like that. And then, like, you know, two days later, some other person completely mm -hmm. different reports 22 different vectors for the same vulnerability type and there's a little bit of overlap but not all that overlap and it makes it very clear that you know the depth of the research is not necessarily there yeah and one of one of the last things i want to say about you know Microsoft and the fact that we are in all three roles, you know, of, of disclosure, vulnerability research, um, you know, both the finding, coordinating, and the fixing side. Um, but as finders, when we go to different vendors, um, we've had to we've had to actually prove it. Just like any other researcher, we've had to prove it to them sometimes by popping calc. You know, um, this is this has definitely happened in the course of my, um, you know Microsoft vulnerability research, where a vendor just didn't believe us, so we had to, you know, we had to show them. So, but part of that part of that mission for us is actually education for them, right? It's just like any other researcher; it's education. Like, no, really, this is exploitable. I promise. Here you go. And they're like, what? Why? Why? Why, why is this calculator showing up on my desktop? I don't understand. Um, and then we use that as a way to start a conversation with them about secure development, because we're saying we're saying to them, look, we've you know we've taken our lumps over the years, we've learned our lessons um, in the following areas, and we'd like to help you because you run on our platform. We'd like to help you get better because that makes our platform more secure. So we start talking to them about ways that they can catch these vulnerabilities earlier in the code. But it's an educational process, just like any other you know, researcher who comes to a vendor you know, and says, hey, um, your fly's down, you might want to pull that up. You know, um, we not only say, you know, say that, but we also, you know, we also definitely try to, to make it so that they don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again. All right, so we're starting to get the uh, hand signals, but I want to one, ask you guys. One last thing real quick. Um, real quick? Yeah, just as a heads up, there are multiple <laughs> vulnerability databases that do this. The data is not public. When OSVDB has a data set, we will make it public. But uh, one of the things that it's been fun tracking is what we call researcher confidence. And OSVDB is actually going to uh, eventually track vendor confidence as well. So researcher finds 50 vulnerabilities over the year, and let's say 45 are accurate. Well, that starts to give us a percentage you know, of success rate in finding a vulnerability. And at least one of the, the VDBs represented here, and it's not OSVDB, tracks it even beyond that. And when you start to look at these statistics, you know, Steve, Chris, and I, we're looking at the data, and we're like, oh, yep, we know this guy. Yep, that's accurate, that's accurate. And you know, some of these, it's like, it's amazing that some of these researchers that are well-known and liked all of a sudden have a 60 or 70 percent success rate. You know, how many of you know that it, someone has a 30 or 40 percent failure rate on reporting a vulnerability that is not accurate, can't be reproduced, or something else about it is wrong? So down the road, look, look forward to that because I, I think it will be very telling not only what we deal with, but a lot of the big names that you guys recognize. You know, it becomes neat. All right, so we're going to be going to the next room here. He's telling me no, but I want one comment from Alex and maybe Art on what do you think about CVSS that leads us into our, uh, our, our room? Uh, 
Two, thing, two things with, that are wonderful about CVSS. I, all right, so I'll back up. My problem with CVSS is this. It's an it's a attempt at formalization of something that doesn't exist. Um, I like the ratings. There's nothing wrong with weighting and scoring and trying to figure out how smart something is. But when you start multiplying ordinal values together, you break the fundamental way that the universe works. Uh, you, you just can't do that. And you end up with, you know, jet engine times peanut butter equals shiny. And you're telling me that the result is shiny. The second problem with it is decimals aren't magic. They're not unicorn poop. You can't just add them willy-nilly and suddenly it's a ratio scale. It doesn't work that way. Um, the, and so the problem is that it may be right where you have a 15.4 is actually more severe than a 13.2 but when it is wrong, because you're doing the wrong things with math, it will be really wrong, potentially. And that, that's dangerous. I like it. I wish they just wouldn't multiply things. Just give me a freaking baseball card, scorecard-like thing, and let me look at it, because I can look at that and digest it myself. So there are two answers. Uh, I have two answers to that. <laughs> uh, what, one of them off. is that uh, there Fuck is time. and you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was last night. I haven't had enough to drink. That was, that's why I'm hoarse. <laughs> uh, CVSS version 3, there are some rumblings within the special interest group about thinking about that. For, so for those of you who are stuck with CVSS version 2, with its uh, you know, warts and all, if you have any concerns, you can bring it up to uh, bring it up to me, or uh, I'll, I'll name Katie as well, or Art, because we're all one way or another, kind of at least indirectly involved on the SIG. Uh, the other thing is to address at least some of the limitations, some of which you've alluded to, Alex. Um, there's this thing called the common weakness scoring system, which isn't uh, at the vulnerabilities. It's at the when you find a weakness indication of the potential for a vulnerability. Uh, it still has multiplying ordinal values by ordinal values, but it has built into it uh, continuous uh, values as well for those people who are sort of the expert users. I think we need to recognize that most people who are using CVSS, right, they, they need a score. One way or another, they, sure. they, all they care about is the score. They don't necessarily care about a lot of the fancy math behind it. So my hope is that for CWSS, some of our lessons learned can feed into the, the future CVSS. All right. With that, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. We'll be around. Find us for beverages. And uh, thanks again. Good job, everyone.